Hi, this is Irv Shapiro with the Dr. Vax channel. And today we're going to take a look at part two of our two-part slicer series. In part one, we looked at speed, temperature, the preview capabilities of a slicer, why the order that you print perimeters in impacts speed, and we looked about the strength of your prints. And we discussed the idea that sometimes additional perimeters or walls will make a print stronger than additional infill. Now in part two, we're gonna cover some rather tricky topics. Topics that in fact deserve a whole 10, 20 minute video on their own. I'm going to introduce you to these topics and you can look forward to additional details on these topics over the coming months. The first topic we're going to cover is extruder multiples. Um, I've done another video on how to fine tune the firmware on your printer in order to extrude the proper amount of filament. That's a rather complicated process. It involves G-code, it involves concepts that may not be appropriate for everyone. Everyone might not be comfortable with them. So I'm gonna show you another way. I'm gonna show you if you're under or over extruding, how to adjust it in your slicer settings. Very, very easy. Yes, it does involve a little bit of math, but it's simple math. We're gonna talk about retraction, Z-hop and combing, vase mode, the pluses and minuses, and we're gonna introduce you to the idea that supports are not an all or nothing endeavor. So if this sounds interesting to you, stay tuned and let's learn something together. Okay, we're going to start by taking a look at extruder multiples. Extruder multiples could be a very complex topic. And when using calculations for extruder multiples in order to fine tune the firmware, the software that's embedded in your printer, there are some complicated steps. You have to connect your printer with a USB cable to a program that is able to directly send G code to the printer, you have to send the proper G code. That's after doing the arithmetic. I'm going to show you an alternative way where you can tune your extruder just by changing values in your slicer. Unfortunately, the arithmetic is the same. So let's first look at the issue. If you look at this calibration cap that's shown on the screen now, you see how there are gaps and there are holes and it looks almost like a sponge well, that's a significantly under-extruded model. On an over-extruded model, on flat surfaces, often on the top, you'll see ridges. You'll also potentially see elephant feet or spreading along the base of a model. So we want to get the extrusion correct because it will result in the most aesthetically pleasing model with the least amount of filament. So how do you do that? Well, the first step is you print something that's a known size. So let's turn to Cura and we'll load a model. The model we're going to print is called the calibration cat. So let's load a calibration cat here. And you'll see that it has a number of interesting features. The first feature is that the top is effectively rectangular or square. In fact, it's square. It can test for overhangs. It can test for fine features. It can test for negative features. We're going to use it to test for dimensions. So let's take a look at the web page on Thingiverse where I downloaded this model. This model is by design on Thingiverse. It's an open source model. And one of the things that's interesting about it is that its dimension is exactly 20 millimeters square. So that means when you print one, if it's more than 20 millimeters, you're over extruding. If you print one and it's less than 20 millimeters, you're under extruding, very easy. What's also nice about this model is it takes under an hour to print. It prints very, very fast and it prints without supports or rafts or other special techniques. Uh, it is a very basic, simple print. 
Initially, I would print this with just basic settings. However, I would check one thing, and that is called extruder multiple. Now, the extruder multiple is in different places um, in different slicers. In the case of Cura, it's called flow, and you'll see it's set initially to 100%. So I took basically the default settings for draft mode. I made sure my flow rate, which is called flow in Cura and extruder multiple in most other slicers, is initially set to 100%. So now let's do a little bit of math. Step number one, measure the calibration cap. Measure the known object. Step number two, compare it to what it should be. In our case, it should be 20 millimeters. If it's less than 20 millimeters, we under extrude it. If it's more than 20 millimeters, we over extrude it. So by taking the ratio of the specified size, the expected size, to the actual size, we can find a ratio that can be used to adjust our extruder flow rate in Cura or multiplier in other extruders. So the arithmetic is very simple. Let's look at it on the screen. The new extruder multiplier is the size we expect divided by the size we obtained times the current extruder multiplier. So in our case, if when we printed this, it was 18.5 millimeters instead of 20, we take 20 divided by 18.5 times the current extruder multiplier, or in the case of Cura, the current flow rate, which is 100. That would give us a new value of 108.1, which we can round to 108. So you take now, and you go into Cura. Let's look at the screen together. You go to flow rate, and you change that to 108, and you reprint. It's as simple as that. Okay, let's take a look at a couple other slicers to see where you would find the values that you would modify. In the case of Prusa, you would find it on the filament settings tab under filament, and it's called extruder multiple or extruder multiplier. So you would set this instead of at one, this would be 1.08. You would set this to 1.08. Likewise, very similarly, in Simplify 3D, if we click on Process and we go to the Extruder tab, you'll see their default extruder multiplier is 0.9. Now that's actually very interesting, but um, in our case, we would set this to the new calculated value. Uh, it would be slightly different because we're starting at 0.9 for our setup for our initial print, but it will go up from there uh, by 8% because that's the difference between 100 and 108. So that's all there is to extruder. Print something where you know the size, measure the size, create a ratio between the expected size and the current size, multiply that by the current extruder multiplier, and you'll get a new extruder multiplier. Simple. Okay, now let's take a look at retraction. First, let's talk about the concept. In retraction, in order to ensure that you don't end up with blobs of extra filament in places you don't want on your print, you pull back the filament with the extruder just a bit. You basically set the amount you want to pull back the filament and the speed you want to pull it back at. Now there's a misconception about retraction. Retraction is not about creating a vacuum. It's not about actually pulling filament out of the melt zone, out of the melted zone. All it's about is reducing the pressure to push new filament out. By pulling the filament back, you reduce the pressure to push new filament out. So let's begin by looking at Cura. And we'll see that retraction is on the material tab, the same tab we are on. You enable it here. Now, why wouldn't you want to enable it? Well, in order to show you that, we're going to use a different model, a model that requires a lot of retraction. Let me delete this model. Let me go up and open up 
the Kickstarter calibration model. This is a model that was created by Autodesk and Kickstarter in order to help test printers. So right now, under material, we have, let's set our flow rate back to 100. We have retraction off. If we go ahead and slice this model, we will see how long it's going to take to print. It will take four hours and 17 minutes. Now, leaving everything else the same, let's turn retraction on. Now, one of the reasons that retraction slows down a print is because when you retract, you actually stop your travel of the printhead, you pull back the filament, then you move your printhead, then you have to restart extruding filament all over again. That takes time. So we're going to enable it here, and we're going to slice this model again. And it went from four hours and 17 minutes to five hours and 35 minutes. Now, in fact, it could be worse than that because the default retraction values that Cura uses are five millimeter. I find 6.5 for PLA works better and 40 millimeters per second. Um, I find that 25 millimeters per second work better. And I, I discovered that slower is better by watching a series of videos here on YouTube. So let's slice it again and see how long this is going to take. Six hours. So we went from four hours and 17 minutes to six hours by varying slicer settings. Okay, now we understand why you only wanna use retraction when you need it. If there are no areas that are likely to cause stringing on a model. Let's look at the model here. You'll see these are areas that are likely to cause stringing. If there are no areas that are likely to cause stringing on a model, there's no reason to turn on retraction and your prints will complete more quickly. Okay, let's see now where you would find retraction settings in some of the other browsers. So if we go to Prusa Slicer, you'll see it's listed on the printer setting extruder tab and you'll see the retraction values are in this section here. If we go to Simplify 3D, you'll see that retraction is also on the Extruder tab. Okay, now if you do need to use retraction, how do you make your print go faster? Well, you turn on combing. Combing is a value, that's the terminology used by Cura, and we'll see that listed under travel, and the default is all. Now, what does combing do? Well, combing says that if the travel move, if when you're going to move your print head from here to here, if it's on an open space, turn on retraction. You don't want stringing. But if it's over the middle of the model, it's over infill, it's over something already printed, then turn it off. Don't do retraction because you don't care about the stringing. The stringing is going to be covered by the next layer. Now, the default that's set in Cura of All creates a problem. It means that your first layer and your top layer may have stringing. Let's look at this picture on the screen. This is a single layer print that I use for calibrating combing. And you'll see in this version of the print that there are extra lines. I'll highlight those here. Now let's look at a version with combing on the first layer turned off. You'll see those disappear. Because with combing off, it's going to retract all of the time. So if you need beautiful first layers, top layers, uh, flat surfaces, then at a minimum, set combing to not in skin. Now, combing called combing is, a, is only called that in Cura. It's a little bit different in Prusa Slicer and in Simplify 3D. Matter of fact, it combines a number of different parameters. So that's probably beyond today's scope. If you Google combing and those other slicers, you'll be able to find some additional information on that.
Now let's talk about Z-Hop. One of the problems that 3D printers sometimes have is when you have a vertical structure, let's say one of these spheres here, if we look on the screen here, and the print head is moving, if there's a little filament drop, dripping from the print head, in other words, uh, it's sort of there's a blob there, it may hit that surface and crack it off. If we look at this picture on the screen, here's a picture of a print that has a lot of stringing, and you'll see also there's some defects in the towers. That's caused by collisions between the print head and a printed object. The way you avoid those collisions is you turn Z-Hop on. And um, Z-Hop is a feature that is in the travel section of Kira. So let's look at it on the screen. You'll see it here. Z-Hop when retracted. Um, and depending on the other settings you have, you'll have different Z-Hop options here. But Z-Hop overall is the setting to avoid printed areas. Okay, folks, we have two more topics to cover as part of our two-part 10-topic series. And the hour is getting a bit late. This video is running a little bit long. So I'm going to cover these next two topics very, very quickly as just introductions to ideas. And I commit to you that over the next couple months, we'll cover them in more detail. The first topic we're going to cover is a lot of fun. It's vase mode. But to demonstrate it best, I'm not going to download a model from someone else. We're going to create a vase in literally two minutes. So let's turn to the screen and go into Tinkercad. Tinkercad is a completely free program that's used in elementary schools all over the world to teach children about computer-aided design. So I'm in Tinkercad here. I'm going to click on a cylinder and drag it onto my work plane. Then I'm going to hold shift down, make it a little bit bigger, make it a little bit taller. Now, I'll be the first to admit that this is not a beautiful vase, but it's a vase. So let's download this, and then we're gonna open this vase that we just made in a minute in a slicer, specifically in Cura, to get started and show you how spiralizer or vase mode works. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, let's look at this on the screen again. This is solid. Where are you gonna fit the flowers? Well, that's the magic of vase mode. It does it all for you. Here we go. Okay, now we're in Cura, and we're going to go to prepare, and open, and we're gonna open our simple vase which is just a cylinder. Now, if I go ahead and take some standard defaults and slice this, it's gonna take two hours and 53 minutes to print. And if I go to preview mode, you'll see it's solid. In fact, on this top layer, it's completely covering that top layer. So this is all filled with fill. That's not a vase. How do we turn this into a vase? Well, we go to prepare again. We go now to special modes and click on the item that says spiralize outer contour. Let's slice this again. And now it's gonna print in just 34 minutes. How can it print the same thing so fast? Well, it's not printing the same thing. What it's printing, if we look at it from the top, is it's printing a completely hollow cylinder. It has a bottom and then the sides and a hollow cylinder. And if we look at the top layer, we can see it's just printing the outside. So what does vase mode do? It prints a bottom layer, then it prints a single width wall. So the width of your nozzle, a single width wall all the way up. Now the disadvantage of vase mode is these vases are quite flimsy because they're only a single width on the outer wall. One way to print really substantial, beautiful vases, and I'll show you a picture here, is to use a printer with a one millimeter nozzle. 
So I've retrofitted a Monoprice MP10 with a one millimeter nozzle. Some people think a 0.8 millimeter nozzle is more than enough. And I printed some beautiful, heavy, thick vases with it. Spiralizer mode is called vase mode in other slicers. So if we look very quickly at Prusa slicer, we'll see under layers, print settings, there is a spiral vase option. That's how you set this feature in Prusa Slicer. And in Simplify 3D, under Layer, there's Single Outline Corkscrew Printing Mode Vase Mode. So this is available on all slicers. I encourage you to experiment with this. It's a remarkable thing. And, by the way, it doesn't have to be round. If you want to print a box, go into Tinkercad, create a cube, save it, open it up in your favorite slicer, and slice it in vase mode. Now our last topic can be very, very complex, but I want to introduce a concept that not everyone thinks about, and that's the topic of supports. I'm going to use Prusa Slicer to introduce this topic because it has some very nice features that make it easy to manipulate supports. Historically, supports were either on or off. Now, what is a support? Well, 3D printers have no trouble printing things vertically. And as you tip lower and lower down, gravity is pulling on that object. And if you get to a certain point, about 60 degrees or so, 40 degrees from the vertical, gravity will start to cause it to droop, to pull down. So the way you print things like that is you print supports under it. Let's look at a very simple example. So I'm going to go ahead and add a model. Um, we'll add the calibration cap here. And uh, we can see this is a nice, simple model. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here to make it easier to see. And potentially you could use supports here, under these edges here, around the face. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Prusa Slicer to just turn on supports. So I'm going to go to Print Settings, Support Material, and I'm going to click the checkbox here. Make sure it's clicked to generate support materials. So now we'll say Slice Now, and you can see here where it chose to add supports. So based on the slicer defaults, it thought we do not need supports under the tail, but we do need supports around these features on the face of the cat. What if we did want to support the tail because we want it to be perfect, not to droop at all? So let's go back to our model and let's click on our model and say add support enforcers. What that lets us do is add an object. We're adding a box here. And whatever we cover will get supports. So we're going to cover the tail there with that box. So let's cover it just like that. Click off of it. And now we can see, oops, we have to move it in just a little bit here. And now if we slice, you'll see that this model has generated supports underneath the tail so it doesn't droop. But let's say we want supports under the tail, but we really don't need them on the face of the model. So let's go back to our model. Let's click on the model, and we're going to add support blockers. I'm going to add a box again. This time I'm going to put the box over the front. Let's rotate around, and we just need it over the very front there. Let's actually resize it a little bit. We'll make it a little bit taller. Now we'll slice our model, and let's see what happens. Now we have no supports on the front, but we have supports on the back and under the tail. So supports are no longer all or nothing. Now the capabilities for selective supports are different in different browsers. I actually think Prusa 
Slicer version 2 is the absolute best. Um, and I'm going to do some future videos on using Prusa Slicer version 2 with non-Prusa printers so you can take advantage of some of these features. Kira does have the ability to block supports. It's sort of a kludgy mechanism. It's not necessarily easy to use. Simplify 3D has a very interesting capability where after it's added support, you can click on individual pieces of a support and remove them. So this capability to have dynamic or custom generated supports that you control is coming to all browsers. Okay, folks. I hope this was useful to you. It was a lot of material. And as I said, these 10 topics, these 10 hints, tips, really could each be covered in their own video. And I'll be doing a lot of those videos over the next couple months. So if you want to learn more about all this stuff, please subscribe to the channel, click the bell to get notified, tell your friends, and most importantly, leave me comments. Let's continue to learn things together.